Buenas tardes. Good evening. Welcome to the Instituto of Cervantes. Welcome to the Observatorio. Everybody speaks Spanish or not? Sí. Todo el mundo habla español. No. Someone. No. Okay. No problem. No problem. Welcome to the Observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic Cultures in the United States. It is an honor and pleasure for me to introduce the, this conversation in the Observatorio, entitled The Translanguaging View of the Linguistic System of Bilinguals, Theoretical and Educational Implications. It is an honor because the presenters today are two of the most important linguists in the United States, uh, Ricardo Tegui and Ophelia Garcia, Ophelia Garcia and Ricardo Tegui, Tanto Monta. <laughs> And uh, it is a pleasure uh, because they are very good friends of the observatory since the very beginning. And uh, it is a pleasure also because Maria Luisa Parra, senior preceptor at Harvard University, will be the moderator of this um, talk, of this round table. Let me introduce very briefly Maria Luisa Parra and professors Garcia and Otegi. Maria Luisa Parra has a BA in psychology a PhD in Hispanic linguistics and 15 years of experience in the fields of second language acquisition and child bilingual development. She has taught Spanish language and culture at Boston uh, University and in the Department of Roman Languages and Literatures uh, at Harvard, where she is currently senior preceptor. She is teaching currently Spanish for Latino students, uh, Spanish for Latino students connecting with the community. And she is the coordinator of uh, Roman Language and Literature Initiative and the teaching of Spanish as a heritage language. Ofelia Garcia um, is professor in the PhD program of urban education and of Hispanic and Luso Brazilian literatures and languages at the Graduate Center of the City of University of New York. She has been professor of bilingual education at Columbia University. University's Teachers College, Dean of the School of Education at the Brooklyn campus of Long Island University, and Professor of Education at the City College of New York. Among her best known books are, uh, many of you know them, Bilingual Education in the 21st Century, A Global Perspective, Translanguaging Language Bilingualism and Education with Lee Wei, a 2015 British Association of Applied Linguistics Book Award recipient, her recent books, um, the Oxford Handbook uh, of Language and Society, or Encyclopedia of Bilingual and Multilingual Education, or finally, Translanguaging with Multilingual uh, Students. She is the general editor of the International Journal of the Sociology of Language. And uh, Ricardo Tegui, he's um, emeritus professor uh, of linguistics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. His work in theoretical and applied linguistics uh, has appeared in major international journals such as Language, Language in Society, Spanish in Context, Studies in Hispanic and Lusophone Linguistics, the Modern Language Journal, and the Harvard Educational Review. His publications in theoretical linguistics are in the areas of uh, language contact, functional grammar, social linguistics, and the Spanish in the United States. In applied linguistics, his publications are in the area of bilingual education and the teaching of Spanish as home language and, and as a second language. And he is co-author of uh, Spanish in New York, um, dialectal, dialectal leveling and structural continuity, and co-editor of Sign, Meaning, and Message, among others. Professor Otegi is the founding director of the CUNY's Research Institute for the study of language in urban society. So thank you so much for uh, accepting this invitation today. I thank you all for coming to the observatorio once again. Thank you, and enjoy the talk. So the idea is that we're going to have first Professor Ricardo Tegui to present for 25 minutes, and then we we'll switch to Professor um, Ofelia Garcia, and then we will open the the floor for questions. Um, I just want to say something before, while Paco is plugging the computer. <laughs> I was reading the the title. 
the translanguaging view of the linguistic system of bilinguals, and I was reading the description. And um, when I read that, you know, trans, the definition of translanguaging, right? But the prefix trans meaning going beyond, right? I thought that's a perfect representation of um, Ricardo and Ophelia. They always go beyond what we have ever um, you know, thought um, in terms of language. And every time I read their work or meet and talk to them, I come out with so many new things that I learn from, from them. So I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful talk that is going to be transcendental <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> so yes. Okay. Perfecto. Gracias. Ahí. Okay. So la ya está. Perfect. Okay. Uh, gracias a todos. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for this wonderful introduction, uh, Paco. The introduction with uh, Monta Tanto is always important when I'm with my wife. Uh, <laughs> but I want you to know that my name is not Fernando, but Ricardo. Okay. <laughs> just to uh, just to be clear, the um, title of this talk is uh, perhaps a bit complicated, and I think we can begin by taking each one of these notions, translanguaging and linguistic system, and saying a little bit about each one of them. The prefix trans is in the sense of going beyond, as Maria Luisa just told you, as in the word transcend. And this notion of translanguaging, which we are trying to elucidate today, talks about going beyond named languages. The idea is to think about bilingualism going beyond the categories that we are used to in the form of languages that have named that have names and what is in, what are named languages well a named language is just that it's a language that has a name named languages are things like arabic bulgarian catalan etc etc and the reason that it's important to remember this is that not all languages have names and not all languages have always had the same names. And so a named language is a very important social category. There are many, many people who speak languages that do not necessarily have a name. My favorite example is the Vietnamese who didn't have a name for their language until in antiquity, the Chinese occupation named their language the language of the southern barbarians. That is what Vietnam uh, means. To translanguage then is to think and to theorize going beyond those names. We are trying to see if we can overcome the limitations of name languages. And I remind you that the boundaries of name languages can be and have been very contentious. Everybody knows, is it Hindi and Urdu, are they one language or are they two? People kill over that question of the boundaries of the name language. Serban and Croatian, are they one language or are they two? In our world, everybody knows about controversies as to whether Valencian and Catalan are one language or two different languages. In Even in our closer uh, Ambiente, the question of whether Latinos in the U.S. speak Spanish or Spanglish is also a contentious question. So the name of the language is a sociological category, and the boundaries, the frontiers as to where one language begins and the next language ends is also a contentious issue. These are important social problems that are built around the question of the name language. So. We are now going to talk about the linguistic system, and by that, this is easy. The linguistic system is what everybody knows the linguistic system is. The linguistic system is simply the sounds, the words, the affixes, the constructions, the phonology, the vocabulary, the morphosyntax that we all have. All human beings have a linguistic system, and this system that we have is what enables us to speak and to write and to understand. That's all we mean. So we are going to 
try to theorize, to understand the linguistic system through the notion of translanguaging, which means that we want to understand the phonology of languages and the grammar of languages and the vocabulary of languages. And we want to see if we can understand this by going beyond the named languages, kind of liberating ourselves from the notion of the named languages and see when we think about bilinguals and we have a conception of bilinguals that is not completely tied to the named languages, what is it that, you, that we come up with? So that's, that's the project, okay? The two perspectives on the linguistic system of bilinguals, we call them the external perspective, that's looking at the speaker from the outside, and there is an internal perspective, which is looking at the speaker from the inside. And of course, you're going to say, now, wait a minute, how do you look at the speaker from the inside? Well, we don't, but we try to build theories and test our theories about the nature of the linguistic system, about the nature of the bilingual speaker when seen from the outside. So we want to right away alert you to the fact that you can look at bilinguals from the social perspective, the external perspective, or you can try to look at the bilingual from his or hers, his or her inner position, from the, from the inside. Okay, and what we're going to do to begin is engage in a critique of what we call the dual correspondence theory. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? What, what is a dual correspondence theory? Well, the dual correspondence theory is your theory, the one you have right now. You may change your mind, or you may not, but a, the dual correspondence theory is the one you have now. Okay, and what does that theory say? It says that the dual names that the society gives to the two languages correspond to the mind of the bilingual that bilinguals really are bilingual, that they have two languages, not only because the society says that, but because their cognition is divided in two. There is a Spanish vocabulary and an English vocabulary. Well, everybody knows that. No, 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 no. The society says that they're English words and Spanish words. The dual correspondence theory says that those words live in two different cognitive compartments and that the rules of English and the rules of Spanish that the society says that they are separate really are separate, okay? So the dual correspondence theory about the cognitive linguistic system of bilinguals says the names of the two languages that the society gives really are guides to the linguistic systems actual structure, so that the mind of the bilingual is divided in two. There are two boxes, okay? That's the dual correspondence theory, and that is the theory that translanguaging wants to critique. So one way to think about this today is that this is a critique of the dual correspondence theory, okay? Now let me just remind you of some familiar things that you know. The, du the dual correspondence theory says bilinguals have two linguistic systems, one Spanish, one English, one Arabic, one French, whatever. There are two vocab vocabularies, there are two phonologies, there are two morphologies, there are two syntaxes. The mind of the bilingual is like the society says. Society has two names, the bilingual has two of each one of these things. These two systems have cognitive boundaries corresponding to the two name languages. So you want to know what word is Spanish, what word is English? The society tells you, casa is a Spanish word, house is an English word, okay? That's, that's how you know. So the boundaries are exactly as the society says they are, and that is the familiar dual correspondence theory. Examples, flunk is a word of English, examen is a word of Spanish. Direct object pronouns after verbs is an English rule, she bought it, that's a rule of English. Direct object pronouns before verbs is a Spanish rule. Ella lo compró. Okay? Stop there. That means that the bilingual has two compartments for 
one for English words, one for Spanish words, and they have two compartments, one for English rules and one for Spanish rules. And we've just seen examples of Spanish words, English words, Spanish rules, English rules, two compartments. Finally, last point here, the familiar dual correspondence theory says bilinguals often code switch. For example, he flunked el examen porque actually ni siquiera lo preparó antes de take it. This says the theory that you know and that we're trying to critique is an example of code switching, meaning that the bilingual has been shifting, okay, inside, has been turning on English, turning on Spanish, turning off Spanish, turning on English, turning off English, turning on Spanish. And what you see here is he flunked el examen porque actually ni siquiera lo preparó antes de take it. This is a case of someone who went from one box to the other box. This is part of the familiar theory, the dual correspondence theory. Okay? So, now, what we are going to ask you to think about, to trans to think like translanguaging, to go beyond the normal thinking, is we are going to ask you to think about the uni what we call the unitary theory. The unitary theory is seen from an internal perspective. We think that we want to look at the bilingual from the inside, and this is not a dual theory, but a unitary theory. Now, this theory says that the bilingual has one lexicon, one vocabulary, one phonology, one morphosyntax. Okay? That means that the bilingual doesn't really, in this, according to this theory, the bilingual doesn't have two systems in his mind. He has only one. Everything is just one. It's two from the outside, but it's one inside. So the social duality is not corresponding to the cognitive duality. You see what I mean? That there is a social duality, sure. The society says there are two languages, but translanguaging theory says that duality of the, ex of the external perspective doesn't match. It is not revealing of the internal situation. The internal situation of the bilingual is one of union. There is only a long list of words. Casa and house are on the same list, okay, from inside. Sure, the society calls them different languages, but that's just a social thing. Okay, so the linguistic cognition of bilinguals is unitary, not dual. That's, that's the idea, that's the whole point. That's it, that's, that's, everything is now trying to understand this crazy notion, okay? So here is some problems that come up. There's always the ontological question. People ask, do bi all right now, do bilinguals have two languages? Do the two languages exist? Do named languages exist? Are you really telling me that there is no such thing as English and Spanish? Come on, get serious, all right? Is that what's going on? Is that is what you're telling me? Should I now, when somebody says, uh, ¿Qué te enseñaron en Harvard hoy? No, hoy aprendí que there are no languages. No, that's not the idea. What we are saying is that from a social external perspective, the two languages do exist as social realities. Name languages are social realities. Social realities are very important. Bilingualism is a social reality, and the two languages have a real dual existence from the social perspective. But from the internal perspective, the two languages do not exist. They do not exist as cognitive realities. There is one lexicon, one phonology, one grammar. The unitary theory says that the linguistic system is a collection of features, okay? That Granted, from the outside, the two languages exist. We're not trying to shake up your world that much, okay? But from the internal perspective, there's just a collection of features. There is a single aggregation of phonological, lexical, and morphosyntactic features. And what bilinguals do, somebody says, sounds to me like you are now speaking in what I would call English, Ricardo, sorry. No, I know. What I'm doing is I am exercising a heavy, X degree of selection. From my single repertoire, I am choosing those features that are called English, okay? 
si no quisiera hacerlo con tanto cuidado, I wouldn't be paying such attention to las palabras que uso uno o el otro. But in this kind of setting, you tend to be careful. So you're choosing from a single aggregation, okay? And the aggregation is guided by communicative needs, social convention, etc. So what do we mean? We mean that what the bilingual is doing, who sounds like he's not switching, is doing the same thing that we all do, like monolinguals do it. What's baby talk? Baby talk is making a selection of our words to talk to babies and leaving others aside. Lecture talk, this kind of talk, is very weird, except in this kind of setting, okay? <laughs> Because we are making a selection here and then leaving lots of things aside. Friend talk, cursing, avoiding cursing, that's a nice example. We all have a deep vocabulary of cursed words that we only use in very specific settings. So translanguage in theory says that that is what bilinguals do. They have a single list of features, but they choose to use them only, they choose carefully as they, as they speak, okay? All right, that's an important thing to keep in mind. El bilingüe escoge, selecciona los rasgos que va a utilizar dependiendo de la necesidad social y del momento en que se encuentre y del contexto en que se encuentre. No quiere decir que haya dos vocabularios ni dos reglas, sino que hay una sola. Hay un solo vocabulario, un solo juego de reglas, y uno selecciona, uno escoge the moment that one is appropriate. The, 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 uh, this, those features that are appropriate for the moment and the context. Bilinguals are social actors engaged in feature selection. They know social conventions. Some of them adhere to a no mixing convention, and it appears that there are two separate systems. But in fact, all bilinguals code switch. Now, it's important. The term code switch assume what's at issue. Translanguaging theory says there is no code switching because code switching is an external perspective. See what I mean? Code switching, in fact, is a term that is, that is instead of making the case that there is code switching, the term code switching assumes that there is code switching. Translanguaging theory says there is no code switching. It only looks that way from the outside. The bilingual is in fact speaking with his rules and his words, all of which make up one aggregation. And what looks like code switching, it's a matter of perspective. From the outside there is code switching. There is no code switching from the inside some evidence supporting this theory, okay? So now, what makes us think this way? First of all, there's pervasive code switching in, in all bilinguals, which we say, translanguaging people say, uh, there is no such thing. But if everybody seems to be doing it, which means that uh, that's part of the evidence for the idea that there is a unitary competence. Inability to settle one language or two disputes. By now, linguists should be able to tell the Hindis and the Urdus Technically, by looking at their behavior, whether you have one language or two, in fact, you can't. Linguists can never settle those discussions because those discussions are about social categories. They're not about linguistics in the narrow sense of the word linguistics. Those issues of Valenciano y Catalan, are they one language or two? Those things have to do with social naming and not really with, with uh, the, lingu the, the technical problem. Number three, name languages are social categories. Social categories seldom match biocognitive categories, the category race. Let me linger for a minute in number three. There is an analogy here that's very important. Everybody, for example, in the United States knows about race. People know who is Latino, who is black, who is white, especially black and white. People are very clear who is what. Now, those are social categories. Race is not a bio biological category, it, everybody knows that if you leave it up to the biologists, if the biologists didn't have any social information, they couldn't tell you what race people belong to. They just can't. Just like a linguist cannot tell you whether you have one language or two. So we know that the categories of the society, such as the categories of black and white race, do not map onto biocognitive categories. So that is a very important analogy. Just like being black and being white is very real from the social perspectives, 
and not real at all. From the DNA perspective, from the internal perspective, we, the translanguaging theory says the same thing about languages. The reality of languages is very important as a social category, but it is not reflective of an internal category. Number four speaks, it says both languages are activated in psycholinguistic experiments, cross-linguistic structural priming. If you have studied the literature on psycholinguistic experimentation, there is universal agreement among psych psychologists and psycholinguists that bilinguals the two languages of the bilingual are, all of the, are always what they call active. No matter what language the bilingual is using, the other language is there. And if we have time, I can tell you how the experiments are done. So the two languages of the bilingual are always active is evidence to me that there aren't two languages, you see. What, if you, of course, if you begin with two, then you say, hmm, they're both always active. That tells you that the boundary is not, the internal boundary is not the, the, uh, the social boundaries. And finally, so-called number five, long words do not go through an early period of one word switching. They tend to be fully adapted from moment of first adoption. So if you think about the oldest long words from English into Spanish in the United States, take a word like biles, los biles. Uno tiene que ganar dinero para poder pagar los biles. Okay, that's a very old long word in many, in many Latinos in the U.S. Okay, that's this, what we have discovered is that those words never went through a period of, of Hispanization. People didn't begin saying, tengo que trabajar para pagar los bills with a, a, with a lax uh and a z at the end. No, the word was borrowed immediately already Hispanized. So that tells you that the bilingual is in fact is using only one system for handling his entire vocabulary and that the idea of borrowing is one that we need to think about. So that's evidence in support of the translanguaging of the unitary theory. Finally, some pushback. There are, as you can imagine, some colleagues of ours, <coughs> good people, smart linguists who say, no, that cannot be true. It cannot be true that there is a unitary system. There's something else going on. And if you say, well, why not? They say that code switching is a cons it shows constraints that require that there be internal differentiation. And they say, for example, that in the United States, people say el subwe, el appointment, la babysitter, but that they never say things like the maestra and the casa. That code switching is restricted to Spanish articles and English words, and that that requires that there be Spanish and English as internal realities. Of course, we know that that's not true, because people say things all the time. Just recently, in the past month, I've heard the palanquita, the pollitos. You can see advertisements that say the light cerveza. So in fact, combinations of etymologically Spanish words with an etymologically English article exist just the same. So we think that this argument against the unitary theory is not a very strong argument. The argument says, if you eliminate the internal distinction, if you eliminate code switching, which is what translanguaging does, translanguaging says people are not code switching, then they say, how do we explain these constraints? And the pushback is that really there aren't any constraints. Their so-called code switching is a lot freer than people realize. Another well-known case of a constraint is things like you say lo compré and I bought it, but you never say compré it or I it bought. In other words, the proponents, the defenders of the dual correspondence theory want to say that people are in fact either in one language or in the other language. They, they are in fact not in a unitary competence. They are internally in one or the other. And they use examples like this. Trouble is that then you have ex examples like el examen lo flonqueo, uh, la carta la taipio, I, want to, I don't want to get, lay too heavy a linguistics class on you, but you see the problem? The problem is now you have 
so-called English words with so-called Spanish grammar because you have the, the pronoun placed before the verb and the verb is so-called English. So this kind of situation makes it so that the constraints are in fact not really there. So that's the, the, uh, the, these are the kinds of arguments against code switching that um, we think are not really working that well. And um, now what I want to do is give the, como dicen aquí, darle el piso, uh, <laughs> give the floor over to La Reina Isabel, <laughs> que, monta, que monta tanto y tanto monta, and she will continue from here. And the next slide is yours. Right. Tienes okay. que apretar gracias, este gracias. botón. Gracias. gracias. Okay, ese. Oops, okay. Gracias. All right. Okay, so, um, so uh, I want to now turn to education and I want to ask um, the questions that I want to answer is why? Why does it make a difference whether bilinguals have a unitary system or a dual system for education, right? That's an important question for us. And then what are the pedagogical practices that respond to this translanguaging view? So those are the two questions that I would like to explore with you. Um, and what I want to do, because I thought that you have heard a lot of linguistic stuff, which I think you should remember so you can ask lots of questions afterwards, but I thought I would start with number two, because number two seems to be easier on the head at this point. And so I want to tell you, I want to bring you into a classroom. I want to bring you into a classroom of someone we have been working with. This is a very large project that has been funded by New York State Education Department. Ricardo and I and Kate Menken are principal investigators. Kate Seltzer is a project director. We've involved a whole bunch of people. Uh, but I want to take you into Gladys Aponte's uh, dual language bilingual classroom. Uh, she teaches in English one day and in Spanish the other day. She has, this is a third grade classroom. My work has been K through 12, so I think you have to use your imagination if you're thinking of what happens at the university level. But as always, everywhere, there are Latinx students along all points of the bilingual continuum. There are children who arrived yesterday, and there are th those who are quite bilingual, and there are those who no longer speak Spanish, and they're all in this program. Um, we have worked with Gladys to open up what she calls the Cuéntame Something translanguaging space. In other words, even though she has she do, does English one day and Spanish the next day. During those days, she has a study of bilingual authors, which she calls Cuéntame Something. And this is um, a, just a, a, a little um, a, a look into her classroom when she's doing uh, an anchor text by Julia Alvarez called How Tia Lola Came to Visit But Stayed. Um, and this, of course, is available both in English and in Spanish because, again, she has children in this classroom that are all alongside, uh, along all the bilingual continuum. Uh, when she reads out loud, she does this. And this is what I want you to hear, uh, and hopefully it will work. Uh, no, it doesn't, but it will. It will. It's coming. Uh, it's coming. Is it coming? Come on. Do you have the... Okay. Does it go? We're going to hear three minutes. Okay. Aquí, Tía Lola dice, Pizza Dominicana, Tía Lola calls it, Buen provecho, she adds. It's what she always says before they eat. Their mom has told them it is sort of like wishing somebody happy meal. Levante la mano si usted usa esas palabras, ha dicho, buen provecho. Quien lo ha oído mencionar, su familia lo usa. Cuando alguien está comiendo, entonces, oh, buen provecho. O que te aprovechen. Sí, sí. 
Buen tiempo, oh, buen provecho, que te aproveche, ¿sí? ¿Cómo se dice, cómo se dice eso en inglés? Hmm, las personas, la gente usa eso en inglés. Marcos, ¿qué crees? stop here because it goes on and on uh, but again she's reading this is the English day so she's reading an English text but she is of course doing something very different during this time uh, and in this translanguaging space which she calls Cuéntame Something uh, what she does is she allows the students to participate with whatever resources they have not just English which is the, the language of the day Uh, and she discusses why Julia Alvarez has selected some signs to render in Spanish and helps them see that act of selection of linguistic features as a sociocultural event. Uh, she acknowledges their bilingual, bicultural lives and the continuum of bilingualism in the group. It's almost impossible to teach a group of Latinx students and to have only one, uh, a one specific uh, bilingual group. And she makes the translanguaging visible, and most important, she gives it a legitimate space in school for academic tasks. And I think this is important because otherwise, this is a type of language use that bilingual children never see in school. So it doesn't legitimate their own linguistic practices, their own translanguaging. So it's important for me to say that translanguaging for in this space is not just a simple scaffold. It's not just because uh, there are some students that speak Spanish only, like Marcos, who arrived recently, but it is really a transformative space. It's a space in which all their translanguaging is being legitimized, and, and I think this is a big difference. So one of the things we've been doing with these dual language, and I say like this because I have a lot of problem with those classrooms, but that would be another, another lecture someday. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have been trying to do with the dual language bilingual programs is to teach the teachers to, yes, keep an English use space and a Spanish use space, because you have to have that. You know, sometimes we throw away the baby with the bathwater. Comprehensible input is still important, right? You have to have the students immersed in a language experience, but we build what we call translanguaging lifesaver rings 
uh, for individual assistance of students. Uh, it, it's a way of expanding the zone of proximal development, if you, you, know, if you think Vygotskyan, uh, so that the child is not just immersed in language and not understanding, but it makes meaning possible wherever you might be alongside, along this bilingual continuum. And we've also built, in the beginning of each unit, what we call a translanguaging documentation space, because you need to know what the child knows what the child knows, first of all, and then what the child knows in which language. So it's a way of documenting what the whole repertoire of the child so that you don't just see them as this they know in English and this they know in Spanish, but what do they know holistically? What is the whole child about? And then this translanguaging transformation space that different teachers have done different things with. Uh, Gladys Aponte has chosen to call this the Cuéntame Something space in which she does study of bilingual authors all the time. So one of the things that I think needs to be done is trying to see how we can open up these translang translanguaging spaces within monolingual or dual language bilingual instructional spaces. Because one of the things we have to realize is that many bilingual programs also have the same issue of a monoglossic ideology about bilingualism and they keep these two languages so separately that the students do not know how to bring them together for a bilingual, to build a bilingual identity. So certainly, yes, have the name language use uh, in a space, but also see how you can open up these translanguaging spaces. In a recent book, what we talked about was uh, identifying the three strands of a translanguaging pedagogy. And we talk about the stance, we talk about the design, and we talk about the shifts. Didn't talk too much about the shift, haven't seen uh, the shifts yet, uh, but I was talking to Christiana earlier um, this afternoon, who was telling me that she is an actress, basically, when she teaches, and that she goes with the flow. Because if you know what happens in classrooms, if you know what happens with students, is that the students are always performing, sometimes differently from where you are. So you have to be ready with these shifts, and you have to do this outside of the plan, of the design that you have. So um, you have to have a design, but you also have to have a shift, that you have to be, um, um, you have to know when to shift. But more important than that is you have to have this translanguaging stance. Without the translanguaging stance, you cannot design, right? So that has to be very important. So I want to remind you that one of the problems with the programs that we do have for bilingualism uh, is that we're using um, these old concepts of what bilinguals of who bilinguals are, these dual concepts of bilingualism. Um, uh, concepts that were developed in 1974 by Wallace Lambert of subtractive bilingualism or additive bilingualism and working with one language, an L1 and an L2, uh, whereas well, I think what we're saying with translanguaging and <laughs> bilingual identities is that it's impossible to talk about what's an L1 and what's an L2. So um, one of the things that, that I think has to change is going from this idea, uh, idea that we can just simply add another named language to one that already exists and instead think about how to expand what the child already has, what the student already has. In other words, to leverage their translanguaging to begin with. That's a very different concept from just additive bilingualism, which thinks of you have one language and you're adding a second language as if it was an autonomous structure that is not connected to the first structure. It's very, very different when you think of you starting to leverage the practices that they already have and you expand them. Now, why does it make a difference? It makes a huge difference because um, if you think uh, with the traditional dual additive concept of bilingualism, you always see the student as empty of something which you're going to now teach them, right? 
But if you start with a translanguaging bilingualism, bilingualism unitary view, what you see is you see the child as having a full repertoire, a full repertoire that he or she is now going to expand through your instruction. Uh, and this is a very, very different perspective on how you teach and who your learners are. Uh, and it makes a huge difference as um, to how you do it. So the stance is simply trying to go from a stance that says that learners are have a, a lack. They are deficient in some way. They're missing something. And you're going to give it to them, right? And that's why we call them limited. We call them else. We call them heritage language learners. And I, we had a teacher just recently who told me, and these were four-year-old children in a dual language bilingual classroom, and the teachers told me that they were ni linguist, ni español ni inglés, ni linguist, right? And this idea that they have to have be separate monolinguals, right? A, an idea that a long time ago, François Grosjean, 1982, told us it was impossible to be two monolinguals in one, right? So going from that stance uh, to a stance of these are emergent bilinguals. Bilingualism is going to emerge. This is something that you do. And that you yourself, as a bilingual, shape it into a unitary, and I, saw, I call it a proprio system, right? It's not a system of English. It's not a system of Spanish. It is your own proprio system as a bilingual. And I think we have to think of how that can be shaped and how that emerges. Um, I just want to remind you, I think, that the education of Lati Latinx youth in the U.S. simply usually occurs in five different types of programs. Monolingual programs, those the in English mainstream programs where they're getting nothing. In English as a second language programs, usually for newcomers. And in Spanish as a heritage language programs, when we have not taught them Spanish at all, and then they get to high school, and now we give it to them, and we set up a Spanish heritage language program, or they're then in universities. But those are monolingual instructional uh, models. And then there are bilingual programs, which some of which are transitional in nature, where you're using Spanish only as a scaffold towards English. And then these dual language programs, where again, there is no concept of developing um, a, a translanguaging view of bilingualism or a bilingual identity, but rather always keeping these uh, languages separate. So I want to remind you that uh, subtractive bilingualism and additive bilingualism are not just related to, mono, to the type of instructional program. In other words, you can have bilingual programs that lead to subtractive bilingualism, just as the transitional bilingual programs do. Developing a monolingual ideology, even though they're using the two languages. And I want to remind you that um, there are monolingual instructional programs, such as heritage language programs, that that really develop uh, additive bilingualism. But the problem is that both, uh, I think, uh, heritage language programs and dual language bilingual programs unless you have a pedagogy that responds to a translanguaging view of bilingualism, you are continuing to work with this monoglossic ideology of bilingualism, which again separates Spanish and English into separate psycholinguistic entities. And that's why a translanguaging view makes a difference, right? So what would I say has to be done in order to educate Latinx youth for success? And uh, oh, I'm missing my two twins there. But um, I, you know, I always say that what I have learned, what I do, I have heard from children. Right? I, I work in schools. I hear kids all the time, and they say the most profound things because they don't understand that there's a policy coming up from the top. They don't understand what the teacher is doing. They only understand what affects them. And I was sitting next to a child one time in a dual language bilingual classroom. And it was, I don't know, either the Spanish day or the English day, I can't remember. And he said to me, 
I didn't even ask him, but he knew I was interested in language, and he said to me, even though Spanish runs through my heart, English rules my veins. And from that time on, I've been trying to think, well, what would a pedagogy look like that takes care of his bilingual system that does not separate the heart from the, from the blood circulating in the veins, right? What would it look like? Uh, and uh, that's what led me to translanguaging, because I didn't, you know, I didn't start with a theory. I started with observations of what I was seeing in classrooms, what I was seeing the children do with language, and what I was seeing the teachers do with language, even though when they closed the door, they would say, oh no, I teach today in Spanish only. But there was a lot more going on. Or I teach today in English only, a lot more going on. So I would say that you have to start by leveraging the student's unitary linguistic system to make meaning and learn. That's a starting point. If you start with <laughs> the two separate languages, you're never going to get them where you want to, uh, them to be because they're living in a bilingual society. They have bilingual lives and they have one language system. So you cannot separate it that way. You have to start by leveraging what they already have uh, to make meaning and learn. And then you have to enlarge that system by I would say expanding the affordances to become familiar with new linguistic features that they can then appropriate into a unitary linguistic system. That to me is the most important. As a classroom teacher, what you have to do is to expand these opportunities, these affordances, this, these ways of looking so that they can then become very familiar with these new linguistic features which come from English or Spanish, depending on where you are alongside, along that bilingual continuum, but then that you appropriate them into your unitary linguistic system. Not as a second language, because <clears throat> if we continue to, talk, to uh, talk about learning a second language, who wants to speak a second language? We want to be bilingual. We don't want to speak a second language. We would always keep it separate or heritage. It's our language, right? It's a part of who we are, right? So it's, that's the appropriation part. And the appropriation part can only occur if we then uh, become really familiar and use these new features, do this bilingualism with these new features uh, in a way that, be that belongs to us. Expanding that capacity of linguistic systems to mean with multimodal features. And I want to emphasize this because Ricardo talked a lot about the linguistic system. And I uh, think a lot about translanguaging from a multimodal perspective and the idea that uh, we have to go beyond language, the linguistic system, because we embody certain gestures and that's what makes meaning. And if you've worked with students who do not speak a language and are in a language classroom, you know that acting is the only way to communicate with the visual and all the, the resources we have today. The embodiment of the technology is really, really part of what, <coughs> how we make meaning. So all of the multimodal part, the, the idea that what we do with language is make meaning and communicate with others, and that we do that with a semiotic system that is made up of, li of the la that linguistic system, but expanded with these multimodal features. And then the learning then to select the appropriate features. Um, and I think, and I'm going to just end by reminding you of why translanguaging, for the purpose of what, para qué. This always comes first, but I thought that today I needed to give you a classroom before I talked about the para qué, uh, because I do think that it's, uh, the whole thing has to do with disrupting this hegemony of standardized named languages that are responsible for the failure of the educational programs for both bilingual minoritized children, but also to educate all for bilingualism. Y muchas gracias. Well, thank you, um, Ophelia and Ricardo, for this amazing presentation. Um, I think that our unitary system, it's um, a little bit saturated right now. We need time to, to process. Um, but I think that you have presented very important um, ways to rethink the 
the way we think about languages and especially young children that are being educated and what are the you know assumptions that they encounter in the classroom with their teachers um, and how we uh, teachers could make a difference if we change the way we conceive uh, conceptualize languages and the bilingual um, children. Would you call it bilingual or just language in child? No, I would call it bilingual, bilingual. children, absolutely. Right? What do you, would you agree, mm -hmm. Ricardo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think that it's important to, you know, this, ext this social construction of name mm -hmm. languages has had enormous consequences in all our lives. Of course. And many of us, for, for many of us, that's our identity. So, right. no, no, bilingualism, bilingualism, I think, is, is important. It's still important. Okay, yeah. good. So I, we would like to open the, the floor for, for questions. I'm sure that um, there will be some questions, comments, reactions. Viviani? No, because they have to listen. Gracias. Por eso está lindo. But I have um, a couple of questions, one for each of you professors. Um, my first question is for Professor Tagi. Um, I wrote it on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about this well, bilingual um, students, right, this bilingual children that we have in the classroom, um, um, do you consider the passive bilinguals as well and the sequential bilinguals? Because sometimes, for instance, in high school, some students will learn, you know, after learning uh, one language, as we say in the social construction, right? After the other. Um, so if you've seen any evidence that this will happen with the, uh, the translanguaging, will happen as naturally for the sequential bilinguals than it is um, as it is for the um, simu simultaneous bilinguals, right? And um, also, Professor Otegi, if you have any, if you have had any chance to um, do any research on not just bilinguals but multi multilinguals, um, you know, students who are um, in or subjects, let's say, who are in um, envir in an environment that you have three languages being interacting um, according to the social construct, right? But have you seen that from the point of view of translanguaging, what it would be like, right? That's my first question. <laughs> <coughs> well, I, um, uh, the um, idea that people who are bilingual are bilingual <coughs> is a grand speculation. Saussure, when he began linguistics, if you will, in the, or at least synchronic linguistics in the early part of the 20th century, began to speak in terms of named languages. And we have never gone beyond the thinking of named languages. So the grand speculation is that what the society says is what the cognition is. Translanguaging offers an alternative grand speculation, which is that what the society says is what the society says, but that the linguistic organization of skills in the bilingual is unitary. The person who speaks three languages speaks three languages again in a very important way because the society says that, but there is no reason to believe, perhaps even less so, that the person who speaks three or more languages is has a linguistic competence that is divided in exactly three different compartments. So that's the, the, uh, the idea. This question about should we talk about bilingual children, think again about the analogy with race, which I think is very important. Should we talk about people having different races? Of course, we need to talk about people having different races because people identify strongly as being black or as being white or as being whatever they are. But it's important to remember that that is an identification with a social category and that we're not talking about deep physical differences. And the stance that you take towards people is going to be very different if you are, if you're aware that you have a, a simply a social category or whether you have really something that is cognitively deep. And that is what the translanguaging um, 
proposal is all about. So maybe you need to say something about yeah. the children. Yeah, I, I, I th I'm, thank you for that question, because I think the, this uh, uh, an important difference between simultaneous bilinguals, uh, who, by the way, it's a group that is growing in the United States, it's growing everywhere, but here, you know, uh, most of the children that are in um, special programs for English language learners, I have to keep doing like this because I held, <laughs> hate the labeling, um, uh, whether they're ESL or bilingual, um, they're all simultaneous bilinguals, they, most of them. Uh, it's only later that we deal with newcomers. Uh, um, but it's, I, it's different. But what does not change is the fact that what you're adding, what you have to think about, is what you're adding to them is just not an, an autonomous language <laughs> that is separate from their system. That what you are doing is uh, giving them the affordances to be in contact with new features of how language functions. Um, and so that once you do that, then that, that it's the same for whether it's simultaneous or sequential bilinguals. Um, and as to passive bilinguals, because you mentioned that, passive bilinguals versus active bilinguals, it's the same question. The, same qu the question is, how do you offer them the affordances, right, so that they can act on their bilingualism, uh, so that they can bring it forth. Uh, but the, the, um, this has no, no bearings on translanguaging per se. The, the concept works the same. Las preguntas en español también son bienvenidas. Well, I am a little bit uh, struck uh, by by the word affordances. Affordances. Because, uh, affordances. I am not don't understand very well in which way. I. In which way are you wanting it to mean? Because to afford in English is lo que uno se puede permitir. Y affordances, en este caso, I don't know what it is pointing at. Gracias. Um, para mí, affordances es una oportunidad que se le da al, al aprendiz a ver o a oír una realidad distinta. Uh, es una oportunidad, pero es una oportunidad que nos cambia eh, la perspectiva, el lente, porque estamos, entramos en una realidad nueva construida por una nueva realidad lingüística. Y entonces el maestro eso es lo que tiene que hacer, el maestro tiene que crear oportunidades para que un niño que, por ejemplo, que hable solamente inglés o que se hable solamente español, pueda entrar en este otro mundo para ver la misma realidad, para hacer eh, eh, lingüísticamente otra, otra, construir esa otra realidad con, estas, con estos nuevos rasgos que le van entrando, ¿no? Pero es un mundo lleno de otros rasgos que él tiene que incorporar, que él tiene que hacerlo, el niño tiene que hacerlo auténtico a él, a él mismo. ¿Sí? That's, that's what I mean. Uh, English, Spanish, Spanglish, I don't know. <laughs> what should I call it? Um, um, well, thanks so much. Uh, could you possibly uh, tell us how you factor in, I guess I'm thinking about the, 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 the name translanguaging, which refers to language. And languages, but how do you factor in things or phenomena like, you know, uh, dialects, jargon, um, slang, regionalisms, localisms? How are those categories redefined in terms of translanguaging? You go first. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's an excellent question. Bef before I answer that question, I wanted to. Uh, remind you of some important background 
there, there, and give you some reading. Professors have to give readings. <laughs> there is a wonderful African linguist by the name of Sinfri, isn't that a great name? Sinfri Makoni, who has a wonderful book on reinventing languages. And one thing that I learned reading that book is how the names of the languages in Africa were mostly given from the outside. Yeah. They were given by missionaries so that people in Africa to this day are shocked to know that they are speaking. I spent, uh, Ophelia and I both spent some time in Johannesburg, uh, and we learned from some of the professors there that South, people in, in Johannesburg are sometimes shocked to hear that there is a language called Northern Sotu and another language called Southern Sotu, and that there are all kinds of languages that have really nothing to do with the reality of, of their lives. So that this naming of languages from the outside is something that became very real for, for them. It's very hard for us to understand that. We live inside two highly standardized realities, two languages that have become so codified, so standardized, that we forget that all of this is an invention. Okay? There is, in fact, nothing that says, that's what translanguage in theory says, that you can chop up the languages, the, the mind of the bilingual, in, in two groups. Toda esta separación, este bi del bilingüismo, es, so, es una creación de la sociedad, porque cada una de las lenguas, como dos cosas totalmente separadas, son creaciones de la sociedad. Y yo creo que tendríamos que decir lo mismo sobre todas esas otras categorías los dialectos, los registros, todas esas maneras de, de darles nombres, de rotular la realidad del, del habla, son categorías, nos va a decir categorías falsas, no, no son categorías falsas, son categorías de orden social que no, que no existen como categorías internas. Y, y por supuesto de categorías sociopolíticas así que todo ese nombrar de, todo ese eh, eh, tomar el habla la mente del hablante y compartimentalizarla en diferentes cosas el, este dialecto, este otro dialecto todas esas separaciones lo único que insiste la teoría translingüe es que todo esto viene dado desde afuera porque las existencias de las lenguas viene dado desde afuera a través de procesos de estandarización que tienen sus orígenes en última instancia en la creación de los estados nacionales en el siglo XVI y el siglo XVII. Y el colonialismo. Y, y en el caso de otros lugares de, del, del colonialismo. Así que yo diría que todo eso también cae dentro del mismo parámetro de distinguir entre las categorizaciones sociales y las categorizaciones internas. Yo creo que... Um, Sigo en inglés, uh, right? Because there are people here that don't speak Spanish, right? Uh, no, there aren't. I thought we we had. You can go ahead. Talk. You don't. Sí. Okay. Um, so um, I I wanted to tell you a little bit about the history of translanguaging, just in case some of you have not heard. Uh, translanguaging was first coined in Welsh. It was first coined by a, uh, a by a Welsh educator. His name was Ken Williams, just a regular educator, who thought uh, to himself that the way that they had been teaching Welsh-speaking children by having spaces in which it was only done in Welsh and spaces in which uh, only done in English was not creating, developing a bilingual strong enough identity to keep Welsh going. So that he started experimenting with uh, what he called translanguaging, uh, which had to do with um, having the students sometimes have the input in one language and the output in the other so that they would be working through the two languages together and not separate because they they experience their languages together. Now, translanguaging, so the trans has to do, of course, with this history, but it, it's not translanguage, it's translanguaging, and I want to em emphasize the, uh, the fact that it's a gerund and that that indicates the doing of language. And it, 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 it comes from a, a, a language perspective that may be different uh, because 
Uh, it's about, it's, um, you know, uh, it's, it's based on Maturana and Varela, who were two Chilean biologists who started talking about languaging, and Becker, who was someone who did a translation, and he started talking about languaging and the fact that we don't have languages, we do languages. And then there's a whole Bactinian tradition of we do language, we do languages, we do uh, we language together in ways that uh, it's heteroglossic from top to bottom. He says Bactin says from top to bottom. So this is all. Uh, uh, just an explanation of where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, just one footnote. So, uh, would you be happy if I use the gerund trans translating? Trans translating? Yeah, because if we trans language, <laughs> if there's a continuum in language practices, translation also becomes a social practice and we need to go beyond the convention of translating from one banded language to another banded language a translation is always a social practice if you're translating for a press you do a certain you do a certain form of translation but when you are speaking with friends you are doing a different sort of Absolutely. translation so you need to trans translate <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I don't know if it's working. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to ask you if you can say something about how is the scholar progression of the students in your program, given the fact that the, there is a very strong or rigid curricula in schools regarding language, how how do they face or how is that process? Difficult. Um, if, if, if you want an, uh, an answer, I mean, first of all, it's interesting because um, this all started because I saw it, you know, because it was happening. It's not, you know, if you go into a foreign language classroom, Cristiana is teaching Spanish. It's the only one that I know is teaching Spanish in this room. She has to do some translanguaging in order to make meaning for those students, right? Translanguaging sometimes acting, sometimes going into English. It's, this happens. It happens naturally. But there is no teacher guide who tells you this is what you should be doing, right? So, I mean, you have to start thinking, well, there's something going on that's wrong, that we have been thinking, we have not been thinking about bilingualism in a dynamic kind of way. Um, so, um, so I don't know if I answered the question because I forgot what you asked. You see, <laughs> progress. She wants progress. To oh, progress. You mean st the students who have been exposed to this? It depends. Uh, let me t talk. Tell you first about teachers. Uh, so, uh, if you don't have the school leadership uh, that allows this to blossom, like Gladys does. It doesn't happen because you start doing it and then you do it only when the, the door is closed because they don't allow it. Dual language bilingual classrooms in many dual language bilingual programs that the principal says or the, te the uh, lead teacher says you can only do uh, speak in Spanish this time, you can only speak in English this time, right? So that they have a hard time keeping it up. So you have to have the leadership uh, behind them, so behind the teachers. So that's first of all. In schools where there is support for translanguaging practices, uh, the, teacher, the students are doing well. But I have to tell you that those are the schools in which the principal is smart, the teachers are smart, and the kids blossom because, no, not the kids are smart. They, they, they don't have a st an attitude of the kids are nilingues. They have an attitude of these kids come with such strength. You should see, you know, it's, there is, there is, and that is what carries them. And that's, and that's how they, so this is part, I think, of a package of, of really valuing bilingualism and valuing community practices for what they are and not, thinking that there's a deficit to communities and ways of speaking of, of bilingual communities. Thank you. Um, Adriana, eh, allá atrás y Viviani. Yeah, my, my question was in, in that line. 
how what would you recommend in order to because I've seen many students here in the college who are bi bilingual and who feel that they have a deficit yeah. Yeah. and of course they they have interjected all the all the social um, stigma and we try to 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 tell them that it's a, it's a, it's a richness that it's, it's that it's the opposite but sometimes they just don't want to believe it or they are afraid to cross um, to really start experimenting with their bilingualism and they prefer to privilege one in at least in the in the college setting and maybe with their friends or their family the other one or or more um, freely but but it's it's hard to come up i mean how what would you recommend in general as as a society as a community of teachers at all levels how can we foster um at least to break the stigma of 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 understanding the bilinguals as lacking as opposed to you know, with extra skills. Um, you know, I don't know. When you speak, I um, sometimes I'm very hopeful and sometimes I'm very pessimistic. I think assessment is a big, big problem uh, because the assessments are in one language or the other. Um, and that's what schools value and that's what drives instruction. Um, so having said that, as, uh, setting that aside, I think that bilingual students have to also have models, educated models. They have to hear teachers also translanguage. Um, if you just tell them about it, they don't believe it. If you show it the way that Gladys does, and remember, this is not the whole day. She does it during a specific time, which she has now set aside. But now they're starting to see that language is about um, the use of language is what's important. Their ability to infer, their ability to make meaning, their ability to find text-based evidence, all of that is what's important. And it doesn't matter whether they do it in one language or the other. And I think that, that they need models of that. We don't have enough models of that, not at all. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's quite, kind of what I have been doing in the classroom mm -hmm. with um, Latino students. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I provide models um, and information to, you yeah. know, show that there's a different way to see their own reality, to understand their own reality. And um, at this level, in college level, to your mm -hmm. um, goals mm -hmm. of translanguaging, we add the critical mm -hmm. awareness, right? Mm -hmm. where, where are these notions coming from? Yeah. Where this notion yeah. of being right, wrong, and yeah. languages? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of reflection, but it's easier to do it with uh, the high, um, college students, although I think that children, no, they can, they can do it. children oh, yeah. are very capable also, but you have to, it's, it's a process and you have to come yeah, from, from teachers and administrators in the back. Mm -hmm. um, my question is more about how do, hi, um, how do parents react to these programs? Have you found that they're very supportive of bilingual programs? Have you found that they're resistant to it, that they prefer that um, students be taught in English? I'm talking about the students in the classroom themselves. I think that's a large question. It depends on the community, right? Um, but I, you know, I find that more and more the Latino community wants a bilingual education for their children. They want their children to be bilingual. Um, the, quest, the problem is that the only programs that we have seemed to have established in the United States for them are these dual language programs that I don't know what's happening here, but I can tell you in New York, I have a lot of problems with them because they are instruments of gentrification to bring in white kids into, into the public schools rather than really, really uh, developing the bilingualism of uh, the Latino uh, children. 
and oftentimes I see that there's a kindergarten class of 20 and then they have, they're supposed to have a first grade and the first grade is supposed to have 50% of kids who are, are, are supposed to be English language learners and the other 50% not. And they select the ones that have the most possibility for the dual language programs and put the others who really would need bilingual instruction in ESL classrooms. And I, I have lots of problems with the way that they have been socially engineered. I, when you walk into a community, you have to know who, the, who is the community, what are their strengths, what is it that they have, and then you have to build a program for them, a bilingual program for them. You cannot start with a model and then say, this is the model that this community has to have, because those models do not work. Uh, so that's, that's the issue. But I think that, uh, I, I tell you, I just had a student who finished a dissertation of, with mothers of children who were classified as English language learners, sorry, <laughs> I call them emergent bilinguals, and uh, who had disability, and uh, who also have, were classified as having uh, disabilities. And the big reason why they wanted their children to be bilingual was that they were going to be deported and they wanted to make sure that their children continue to speak Spanish. And I was amazed that this is the way in which Spanish is being seen, but it, this is a re, a so, our social reality too. So there's, I think that there's support. There's a lot of support. I want to go back for a minute to your question about what to do in, with the, the uh, <clears throat> sense of stigma among some of the bilingual students. I would say that there, there are a number of uh, items that, that are good to keep in mind. One is this notion of languaging that there is no doubt that those students are languaging and that they're languaging at a very high level of effectiveness. And it is important for us, and it is very hard for us, to remember that languaging is the primary observation. What, what we are doing is we are languaging. It, después de eso, ya a un grado de abstracción much higher, we are saying, estamos hablando en español, or we are speaking in English, or estamos code mixing. That is a much higher level of abstraction. So you have to recognize that those students are languaging and that they're languaging very successfully. And if you can get them to see that, then you, ha you are already beginning to break this notion of, of the stigma. Then I think this idea of the modeling that the two educators have mentioned is extremely important. Si nuestro propio comportamiento lingüístico es siempre acartonado y siempre esclavo de las diferencias entre las lenguas, then the students who are in fact translanguaging are, are going to say, now wait a minute, yo quiero hablar como usted, right? So what you need to begin to do is yourself have to be more relaxed about your linguistic usage and try to get them to see that the way one gets to a very standardized form of language is beginning from where you are. And that what you are is in fact a very, as you say, you use the word rich yourself. It is a very rich way of languaging over which there has been an overlay of social categorization that then gives rise to the stigma. So it's important to remember that standardized languages have in fact been used as instruments of control of populations. Finally, I would remind you, I think, of the obvious parallel between what your students are going through and what the monolingual students is going through who comes from a family of parents with little education. Those students, ya sea in Latin America or in España, ya sea in los Estados Unidos, in whatever language, a student who goes into a high school or a university from a class of working people is faced with a very strange kind of language. And that, so the situation of our bilingual Latinos in the United States is very similar to the situation of any, any student. The issue is that our bilingual students tend to be working people, not from professional families. So they're faced with this break between the way that you language in the school and the way that you language in the family and all the labels that have been put on top of that. So. I would say those three are, are very important elements because your question is a very fun, it's a fundamental one.
Um, we have time for one more. Un comentario más. Heritage learners. Gracias. Um, and uh, you seem to be a little bit reluctant in its usage, uh, the usage of this word. And uh, and I and I agree. And I agree. I, if you were reluctant, I agree with you, because there is a tendency of repeating, imitating, copying what somebody coined. Mm -hmm. Somebody coined this word just like many other words. And uh, if a heritage learner is someone who learned from the family, well, if you live in Argentina, or you live in the Re Dominican Republic, or in Spain, or wherever, who do you learn from? Mm -hmm. You learn from your family. Mm -hmm. So this is evidently a wrong term, which we should change, you know, perhaps uh, in your next publication, <laughs> when you need to use that word, perhaps coin another one, a more appropriate one, I suggest, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, I have, I, I have a lot to say about that, but we have Maria Luisa here, no, who really no, knows. No, pero eh, es cierto, es un término que eh, se ha ido, um, usando sin realmente pensar y problematizar en el término, aunque hay artículos que ya lo han problematizado sí. y han cuestionado el uso de heritage y de herencia. Y, y yo sé que, yo, yo que so, soy vieja y he visto toda la historia, les puedo decir que la palabra heritage en los Estados Unidos, como heritage learners, no empezó hasta que se silenció la palabra bilingüismo. O sea, en el 2002, cuando se pasó el No Child Left Behind, la, la palabra bilingüe se, inclusive se omitió de toda la ley. O sea, y hubo todo un cambio de ser Bilingual Education Act a English Language Acquisition. Y entonces, al no tener acceso a la palabra bilingüe, se crearon estos otros nombres. Dual Language, por un lado, que no tiene sentido ninguno, Y, y por el otro lado, Heritage. Pero Heritage se usaba en el Canadá, pero no se usó en los Estados Unidos hasta el 2002, que hubo una conferencia en California y fue y coincide con el silenciamiento del bilingüismo. Y yo diría que eh, yo no he encontrado otra, otra palabra mejor, no, no, no que yo... Eh, porque, por ejemplo, yo sé que los españoles están hablando de new speakers, eh, y muchos, los europeos, perdón, no solo los españoles, lo, todos los europeos están hablando de new speakers, que es más o menos, que también tiene esa con, puede tener esa connotación, no solo de heritage, pero, um, pero eh, yo no, no he encontrado otra palabra, pero yo sí creo que lo que... Como quiera que se le llame al Heritage, el Heritage Language Program, se le tiene que prestar más atención al bilingüismo. Y como quiera que se haga el dual language, se le tiene que prestar más atención a este bilingüismo dinámico, que es lo que yo creo que diferencia esta visión de ese bilingüismo aditivo que no funciona ya en una sociedad como la nuestra en el siglo XXI. No funciona. Así que hay que cambiar I wanted to add a word that hasn't been used with, res with all due respect for professors and teachers of heritage language speakers. The term is pernicious. Let me tell you why the term is pernicious. The term is pernicious and it is new. Again, los que, los que somos viejos sabemos este cuento desde hace mucho tiempo. There used to be no heritage classes in the United States at any level. They were called Spanish for native speakers. Okay. ¿Qué ha hecho el término heritage? What has happened is that it has turned a certain kind of speaker into a non-native speaker. In other words, the term native has been privileged now and reduced to those people who have acquired the language in a country where the language is the majority language. In order for you to be a native speaker of Spanish now, it turns out you have to have learned Spanish in Iberia or in Latin America. If you learn Spanish in the United States, now the title of native speaker has been removed from people. Mm -hmm. Now, once you remove the label of native from someone, now you can really go to town, because now you can devalue that person's way of speaking. Mm -hmm. Así que yo creo que el, el término es 
más peligroso de lo que parece porque le niega al estudiante latino la categoría de hablante nativo y entonces ahora tú no es que tú no tú no hablas el español de forma nativa y por lo tanto tu forma de hablar puede uh -huh. cuestionarse Deficiente. puede puede menosvalorarse verdad puede postergarse mientras que antes o si uno se supera ese término, uno puede decir, no, estos son hablantes que hablan la lengua de forma nativa. Y que es así, estos hablantes hablaron español solamente durante cuatro años. Los primeros cuatro años de su vida, una gran parte de estos estudiantes, so-called heritage speakers, hablaron solamente español. Negarles la categoría de nativos, tiene, hay una agenda política detrás de todo esto, y es minusvalorar su manera de hablar, de manera que ahora podemos... Podemos hacer picadillo con ellos. Usted no habla, usted tiene incomplete acquisition, cualquier cosa. Así que yo creo que la crítica del término de heritage speaker, a los que no somos educadores y no estamos dentro de ese problema, yo lo veo muy claro que es una manera, que es un término pernicioso. Um, Daniel, un comentario. Sí, hay hablantes en Iberia, en Latinoamérica y en los Estados Unidos que usan el verbo lenguajear y son poetas. Digo, para que sepamos que hay hablantes en muchos ámbitos que usan el verbo eh, lenguajeo y lenguajear. Me parece muy interesante por la relación con la su charla. Es interesante porque es el, el, el término primario. La primera observación es, pero bueno, ya nosotros, los que hemos crecido en estos ambientes, del, al, mucha gente que crece en, en el tercer mundo lo encuentra muy natural. Pero lo que la gente hace, la gente está hablando, está lenguajeando. A nosotros nos es imposible oír a nadie sin hacernos la pregunta de en qué idioma está hablando. Pero lo que hay que recordar es que esa pregunta ya es una pregunta a un nivel secundario. Ya eso es no hacer la observación, sino recategorizar la observación según las, la información de las categorías sociales. Muy bien, bueno, pues estamos con, con el tiempo encima, pero muchas gracias por una no, maravillosa. Gracias.